Hi, I'm Felda Blythe, historical educator and fashion reinventor, as well as Hellenic polytheist. And welcome back to another installment of Hellenism 101. If you haven't gotten a chance to see my video, What is Hellenic Polytheism? I will link that right over here, and I suggest checking that out before diving into this video. So this video is all about altars, shrines, and sacred spaces. Probably one of the most important aspects or physical aspects of Hellenism. So we're going to jump into what are the differences between altars, shrines, and sacred spaces, as well as what they look like today, and how you might be able to construct one for yourself in various different areas. So first up is an altar. What is an altar? At its most basic, an altar is a focal point for an entity. And it is a place where the offerant makes an offering to them. And in some cases, an altar is actually a really good test to see if a figure was just from literary tradition or if they were actually worshipped in a religious sense. So, for example, using the Odyssey again, Odysseus, there are altars and shrines to Odysseus that were found throughout Hellas. So that is a good indicator that not only was Odysseus a literary figure in the Odyssey, but he was also a religious one. Whereas someone like Charybdis, the whirlpool that was a threat to many sailors in a lot of literature at the time, she does not have any altars or shrines or sacred spaces that at least I am aware of, which is a good indication that she is purely a mythological figure and did not actually see any worship. Now, there are a few exceptions in which a figure makes the transition from literary figure to religious one. And one of those examples is Tyche or Agatha Tyche. Tyche is a goddess or daemon of fortune. And she wasn't really worshipped at all, much that I could find throughout the Hellenic world, but she was worshipped in the Hellenistic world. In fact, she became like one of the most important deities in the Hellenistic world. And in fact, worship of her persisted into the Roman period and even into early Christianization. In fact, many cities had their own Tyche, so you have Tyche of Antioch, Tyche of Rome, etc, etc. So that's an interesting example of when a figure sort of makes it out of mythology and into the sphere of receiving a cult and worship. So then, what is a shrine? And now I'm going to get a little bit into the weeds here and semantics, which I usually don't, but it can be helpful to know definitions before you decide to throw them to the wind. And you will soon find that I tend to use the term altar and shrine interchangeably, although in some cases they are not. It's complicated. I'm going to get into it. So whereas an altar was a workspace, often there were common altars or public altars which could, in which you could make sacrifices to multiple entities, multiple theoi, a shrine was a devotional space. So that would be usually dedicated to one deity or even a specific epithet of a deity. For example, Zeus Ctesios, Zeus of the pantry, protector of the home, he is not going to have a same shrine as uh, Zeus, as Zeus Katabatis. I think I'm saying that right. Zeus is descending, who usually shows in the form of a lightning bolt. Those are two different aspects of Zeus very different aspects of Zeus, and so it makes sense that the shrines to them would be different. Interesting point of note, shrines could also be on altars, in which things get a little bit, you can see how things get confusing in there. So again, I often use the terms shrine and altar interchangeably, but know that altar was where sacrifices usually took place, whereas shrines were devotional, and offerings that took place in them were usually votive in nature, whereas, you know, libations would be done at an altar. And then there is the temenos. So temenos often gets translated as temple. Now to me, temple, the word temple evokes more of the building, the physical structure, and not so much what temenos always meant. So here's a definition from Merriam-Webster about what temenos means. Temenos, plural temenoi, is a temple enclosure or court in ancient Greece, a sacred precinct. So in my mind, temenos evokes more of the area that surrounds and encloses the altar, shrine, and the building that I would call a temple. So the temenos is like everything within inside of like, usually a fence. 
and the temenos is usually demarcated by a fence or stones that sets apart the sacred space from the mundane world. And everything inside of the temenos was considered property of the deity. So altars, for example, within the temenos, but they are usually outside of the physical temple, whereas shrines were usually inside of that physical building. However, altars and shrines can be really diverse. There's evidence of indoor ones, outdoor ones, ones that are high up, ones that are in the ground, some were public, some were private. It gets really fun and temples and, and it gets really fun and altars and shrines were really as diverse as Hellas itself. So I, I know I went a little bit into the hairy territory of semantics. So to further demonstrate the differences between all of these things and how they function together, we're actually gonna hop on over to Assassin's Creed Odyssey, spoiler free, don't worry. And I am going to walk around one of these sacred spaces and talk about what each aspect was and how it worked together. So here we go. I'll see you all on the other side. You can tell because I'm at a different angle and I put on some headphones that I'm now entering gamer mode. So let's get into Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Well, I'm going to pop up the video around me and I'm going to put me in a corner. So here I go. Whoop. All right. So I spawned in Olympia in the Temple of Zeus and I'm going to jump down next to it just to show off that I don't take any fall damage anymore. Lots of temples in the game. But a lot of them are occupied by enemies, so it took me a little bit to find what that's not. So as I'm running around the outside of the temple, you can see there's like that fence that I was talking about earlier. Here's some people having a great time, and I ruined their party, as usual. But yeah, you can see the temple here. I mean, this one's quite elaborate. The Temple of Zeus at Olympia, Olympia and Zeus, was like really big and grand and like bananas. You should Google it later too, because it's quite crazy. So you can see there's like a wall, a fence here. And that's what I was talking about with the Temenos. So like, that's the temple. That's the physical temple. But the Temenos, the sacred space, is the wall that surrounds the temple. So everything inside of it is considered sacred. And then it took me 97 years to find the front of the temple to enter it. <laughs> So here's the temple and the temple entrance. It's quite grand. <laughs> so these could be considered probably different shrines. I'm not sure if they're supposed to be to different epithets of Zeus, but anyway, here's the main shrine of Zeus where offerings, votive offerings would have been left. So you can see there's flowers, there's shields, there's gold. So that's where people would leave those kinds of things and, and commune. So that could be, I guess, kind of, that's more of a shrine than an altar because there's no um, sacrifices of blood that happen inside of the temple. But there is a public altar that I'm about to take you to. Here's another shrine of Zeus. This could be considered another shrine of, of Zeus. This here is where the sacrifice would play, play. So this is very much an altar TM. You know, there's pretty sure it's a goat or a pig. I can't quite tell that would get killed sacrifice and then that fire up there would be ever burning and you would burn the offering to the deity. So let's check out a different temple. So this is the temple to Hera and inside we see a shrine. Oh so this is much much quieter. Not as crazy as Zeus of Olympias uh, of the Olympian Zeus. But here we see votive offerings. There's some offerings of food and there was jugs and pottery in there and this fence all around the outside where all these pillars are. This is the Temenos. This is the sacred space to Hera. And then back here was uh, an altar. Now I'm not quite sure if a sacrifice of animals happened at this altar. Again, it's a video game, so they're not like totally accurate, but here's an altar, which is outdoors. So let's get a bird's eye view of Olympia. So there's, there's so many temples, <laughs> so we can see. And down here where we're next going to visit are a bunch of different shrines to various Olympians, the Dodecathon of Olympia. So we can see Shrine to Artemis, we can see Shrine to Aphrodite, Demeter, Hera, where people will leave fruits, bloodless offerings, fruits, there's some pottery, some gold. So I would consider these more shrines than altars. And as you can see, they're not really like demarcated by any sort of temple area. I guess one could say that the raising up of them on the steps could be uh, considered the sacred space. 
You could have altars with no shrines. Uh, I don't think you usually have a sacred space without an altar or a shrine. We could Temenos without one of those, but yeah, so that's sort of the journey in Assassin's Creed of how this might have looked back in Classical Greece. So hopefully my uh, journeying around Assassin's Creed Odyssey was helpful for you to see how these would have looked like in ancient Hellas. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the purpose of a sacred space. And this might seem like obvious, but I think it's fun to get into it a little bit. So as I mentioned, the sacred space is the focal point of a deity's or entity's uh, cult and worship. They are that point liminal and sacred in which you reach out to the deity and the deity reaches back. They are, in a way, their home away from home. As I mentioned, everything inside of the Temenos is the deity's property, and so therefore it was also seen to be protected by the deity. And because altars were considered so protective, that is one of the main reasons they were so important. You know, you want to appease and keep clean Athena's temple, and Athena might reward you by protecting your city. At least that was a lot of the logic in Athens. Here's a quote from Suppliant Woman by the playwright Aeschylus. The altar is an unbreakable shield, stronger than any fortification tower. Wow, that is a, that's a pretty bold statement. But you can see, uh, altars and temples were extremely protective, which is why protections in Hellenic polytheism look a little bit different. Uh, by a little bit, I mean a lot different than modern witchcraft. I see sacred spaces of having four main purposes. One, they are protective. Two, they are the sites of communication and communion with the divine. Number three, they are the hearts of religious cults. And four, they are focal points of festivals and rituals. It's hard to have Hellenism without a sacred space. That is like the main physical aspect of Hellenism. However, fret not. Just because you can't have a, an altar, a shrine, or a physical temple does not mean that you can't be Hellenic polytheist. I will get into all of that and how to translate this into a modern age where we have modern problems. And you know, it's, it's not the public religion, so people aren't always as accepting of it as they obviously would have been back then. So I will get into all of that. So now we're going to talk about the types of altars. With shrines, as I kind of said a little bit earlier, there are as many types of shrines as there are deities. <laughs> shrines are a lot more personalized and specific to certain entities, but there are common similarities in altars. There are mainly two types of altars that you will come across. They are the bomoi or bomos for the singular form. Uh, those usually have a flat surface on top. They are raised above the ground. And if you watched my uh, What is Hellenic Polytheism video, you will note that these would be for Oranic deities. These are for the heavenly deities. So they would have a flat top so you could hold the offerings and then they, they would also be outside. And then that way the smoke from the incense or for whatever you were burning would go straight up. Simple altars could be like waist high or they could be like meters high. <laughs> Usually they were proportional to the, the temenos, the sacred space. And then there is the bothroi or the bothros, the singular form of that, which is a low lying structure, usually actually on the ground uh, with openings to the earth. Uh, some of them could even be in the ground. I will show you my bothros and it is in the ground. So those would be dug. Usually liquid offerings would be poured into these pits or onto the bare earth. And the actual pit part that dug in the earth could be permanent or it could be temporary and covered back over, depending on the cult and the ritual needs. As you might assume, if the other one is for the Oranic deities, these ones are for the Chthonic entity. So like the dead, Hades, and heroes. So now that I've gone over a little bit of historical practice, let's get into modern practice and how these things translate to today. So I am actually going to do a sacred space tour for you. I usually don't show my sacred spaces and I'm not going to show you all of them, but I will show you an example of an altar, which is where my main sacrifices and offerings take place. I will show you my shrine and then I will show you a temenos, which is uh, also an example of an outdoor sacred space. So we're going to get into that this way. I already saw altar tour. Um, I can't find my normal steady cam mount, so we're gonna have to use a tripod as a steady cam, so bear with me. Also, my audio will be a bit different, but uh, you know, whatever. We're going to start with my altar, my main workspace. So that would be this over here. So this right here is my main altar. As you can see, it's like there's stuff on it, but it's still fairly empty. There's Hestia over there. That's pretty much the only consistent 
part of my altar is Hestra over there and then I have these two Greek style pillars with tea lights on top that I light when I'm doing a ritual. I have an incense burner, I've got my lighter, I have a little cup from a ritual I did yesterday I didn't clean up. And then these are here my often my common libation aspects. Now usually these I have a lot of altar storage too which is really nice so I usually keep libations and other aspects up there but I just did a ritual last night and I didn't feel like cleaning it up. Altar storage here. This is for the items that I use the most frequently. Items I use less frequently are over in here. All my herbs are physical aspects, things that I, I don't use as often. So yeah, this is my, and this is my like libation jug. But yeah, usually I will set up my space, light my candle. Sometimes I have an altar cloth. Mine's being cleaned currently. So I'll set up the space, pour my libations, take it outside burn a candle, burn some incense, make a prayer. This is also where I do like modern witchy spell work too is at this altar. And so obviously those types of altars will look significantly differently, but this is where I do like my main. All right, so that was like my altar TM. And now behind me, as you can already see, here is a shrine. I'm gonna come over here. This right here is my shrine to Athena. Yes, I have cosplay prints on my shrines. Listen, I just love cosplay prints. And also, I, I tend to select artwork. If I don't have an, like a physical statue to a deity, I tend to get artwork that reminds me of them, and then I put it there as a point for them. So, over here I have a candle. It says Athena's Library from a local candle shop. I have some room spray that reminds me of her, as well as I keep my, my oracle cards. I keep most of my methods with divination with my Apollo shrine because he's the, you know, god of prophecy and a lot of divination. But I tend to keep like oracle cards with Athena just because to me they're more reflective, which emulates a lot of her aspects. But yeah, I have books over here. Here are some uh, old books that I made an offering to her as a votive offering. Oh, this should not be here. But yeah, you can see Athena is on a bookshelf, which seems very apt for her as a goddess of knowledge. Athena is mentioned in the Odyssey as having a wand, so I keep my wand up here more to represent her than anything. I don't really use wands in my practice. Wands are also not really used in Hellenism, but even my witchcraft practice, I don't really use wands. Also, you can tell this is a Harry Potter wand from Universal. <laughs> but I mostly use it as to, to really drive home that, you know, this is for Athena. And then over here, I have some rum. I made her a hot toddy. It's a long story. That was part of my UPG. <laughs> made her a hot toddy as a votive libation. A lot of it is things that remind me of her, votive offerings, candles. Uh, I keep her incense that I burn for her right over here. And just really a way to be like, hey, Athena, this is your space. This is where I come to, to most readily pray to her and where I leave my votive offerings for her. Now we're gonna go outside and I'm gonna show you some of my outdoor workspaces. It's about to rain, which is good because it should fricking rain. But yeah, I'm going to show you my outdoor space, so we're going to transition right over there, right now. And now we are outside. Over here is my outdoor temenos. As you can tell, me and my housemate have marked out our sacred space with stones. Uh, there are statues over here. So yeah, this is Demeter. This would be kind of like an altar slash shrine. There's not really a huge place to do sacrifices, but I, you know, pour stuff out the ground. And then this right here is my uh, Bothros. This pit I pour in for heroes and chthonic entities. So that's where that is. It's, it's only a few inches in the ground. Then I kind of separated it a little bit from here so that way there's not any cross-contamination with Uranic and chthonic. But yeah, that's my outdoor Temenos space. I hope this was useful to see. Probably won't show them again unless I have like something really interesting to say about them. Because uh, generally, you know, shrines and altars were... Because generally there were types of private and public altars, and a lot of private ones were kept from strangers. And obviously you guys are strangers. But I felt like it would be helpful for people to see how I set up my altars and shrines. So there you go. This is one that I, I share with one of my housemates. I also have a house altar, which I'm not going to show you, that is also shared by my housemates. And that one... <laughs> It's a bit more chaotic. Uh, but a lot of altars too would have been separated a little bit from the mundane world. So this one is separated with the rocks on the ground. But house altars, like the house altar I have was sort of, it's like a little bit recessed 
into a space in the house to kind of be like this is marking where the mundane world ends and the sacred space begins. So those are my altars. I'm gonna go back to desk felicity now. Bye. So what if you can't build a sacred space? And that is very much the case for a lot of pagans today. A very big concern. There are two alternatives that I see to these permanent structures, and they would be travel altars, travel shrines, or digital altars or e-shrines. And also we live in a modern world, so we can't really exactly build a, these big sacred precincts as much as I wish that could be true. But that definitely does not mean that you can't worship. You don't need a permanent physical structure to worship. The first one I mentioned is a travel altar. These can be in shoe boxes, I've seen Altoid tins, bags, or even as small as a matchbox. The point of travel altars is that they are portable workspaces, and also, if this is your need, they can also be easily hidden. So I don't actually have any travel altars to show you because I usually build them when I'm going somewhere and then I dismantle them when I come back and disperse all of the elements back to where they came from. I do have a permanent travel altar at my parents' house that lives in one of my old childhood drawers, but obviously I'm not there so I can't show you. I'll try to maybe post pictures. So instead I'm going to show you how I make a travel altar when I do travel and it also works well for one that you want to keep in your room. I don't really use shoe boxes. I tend to go with like the really small route for travel altars because I want to be able to fit into a suitcase. So I tend to go with either tea tins or tea boxes or a bag. But I'm going to go with a cloth bag because that's usually the one that I do since it, you know, is far more flexible. But the advantage of a small box is that it, if you want to do Oranic versus Chthonic, you know, you can prop the box up uh, and have it sort of be a raised altar. But for now, I am going to do a bag because that's what I tend to do. So my travel altars are really only a few things, namely a match or a lighter, then a couple of tea lights and bay leaves. And that is usually it. <laughs> However, if I have a bit more room or I want to get a little bit more involved or I have a specific ritual in mind, I'll bring a small offering bowl. I got this really nice stone one from a thrift store and something to represent a deity or an entity or whatever I'm working with. This can be anything from a coin to a drawing to a rock. Now I've seen travel altars that are far more elaborate with some materials for spell work if you do spell work. I've also seen ones that are primarily paper and pencil, and you just sort of draw to create the sacred space. So now that I have all my items in a bag, I'm going to do a, a brief mock setup and pretend that I'm like traveling. So once I have all my items in my bag, I will take them out and arrange them in the space that I'm doing the working in. Once I'm done, I pack them up. Simple as that. If I have the advantage of being out in nature, I will, you know, incorporate aspects of nature and I really go hard and like build this makeshift altar around the items that I took out of my travel altar. However, if all I have is just like a windowsill, that's what I'll do. I'll light the tea light, burn a bay leaf, pray, make an offering, give thanks, and that's pretty much all, all you need. And if I were to want this to be one that I keep in my house, if I am not in a place where I can practice, I'll just put it all there and keep it under my pillow, keep it in my drawer, keep it in my suitcase. Or if I want, which is what I usually do, I will dismantle my travel altar and recreate it for the next time. One of the most fascinating solutions I've seen to this problem of not having space, not having money, not being in a place where you can worship freely are digital altars or e-shrines. Now, I don't personally have any digital altars or e-shrines. I've thought about it, but I, I haven't really gone into it. And I'm lucky I'm in a place where I cover every space with an altar or a shrine because I'm just one of those pagans. <laughs> but I've heard some very interesting ideas. Like for an altar, I've heard of someone building an altar in Minecraft and then burning a, a piece of charcoal on it. And as the smoke rises, they, they meditate and dedicate it to the Theoi. I've heard of people building whole temples <laughs> in The Sims, you know, where they have the altar, they have the space outside, they dress their sims as priests and priestesses, and I think that's a really neat thing to to dedicate. And I've even seen e-shrines that are 
Pinterest boards. You don't even need to have a video game <laughs> to create a digital space. You can create one on a Pinterest, you can draw one. I've seen people use Tumblr as, as a form of an e-shrine or a digital altar. The TLDR is that the Theoi meet you where you're at. And whether that's a digital altar or a travel altar or this big grand outside workspace, they're gonna meet you there. That's the point of sacred spaces. They're gonna meet you at that sacred space. It can become a really special place for you of comfort, even if it is not physical. In my opinion, there is no wrong way to build a sacred space. Well, if you're covered in miasma or do other taboos, I guess there is a wrong way to build a sacred space or if you build a chthonic altar to an erratic deity. But anyways, generally, in my opinion, there's nothing crazy needed to build a sacred space. Most of what it takes is intention and dedication. I dedicate this to you. And you know, dedication happens at altars when the first sacrifice is made. The first time you light incense there, the first time you light that piece of charcoal in Minecraft, that is when the sacred space is created. That can be anywhere, in your home, outside of your home, at the park, in The Sims, on Pinterest, you know? Maybe when you're on Pinterest and you burn a piece of incense over your phone. That's the point of reconstruction, is reconstructing for our modern needs and our modern times. I hope this answers some questions and concerns about altars, shrines, and sacred spaces in Hellenism, and gave you some ideas on how you might go about creating your altar or your sacred space. I love hearing about how people get really creative with this and really let that inspiration shine. Feel free to tell me all about your altars, your shrines, your sacred spaces. I would also love to hear about people who create digital altars and e-shrines because like I, like I said, I've never done it. I don't have any, but I think it's like really, really cool. So I would love to hear of all about your altars and your shrines, whatever you want to share, please pop those down in the comments. And of course, if you have any other comments or any other questions, you can feel free to ask and I will answer them to the best of my ability. And remember, your altar can be as complex or as simple as you want. You can have one big altar with different representations, or, you know, you can have like seven shrines and you don't have bookshelves anymore, you just have shrine space. Or you have no physical permanent altar, have a travel one, have a digital one. Your practice is your practice and the only person who has to worry about your practice is you. Thank you for sticking with me. I hope this was helpful and inspiring. <laughs> and thanks for sticking with me and I'll see you again in a couple of weeks. But until then, bye.